Do you like this show and want to make your own? Let me tell you about Anchor. Anchor is free, and there are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Now you can even add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless for what you can create. Whether it's music analysis, your own radio show, or something that the world's never heard before. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast too with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So download the free Anchor app today or go to anchor.fm to get started. Why is everything always my fault? No matter what I do, I'm always wrong. I'm trying to recover. I'm doing all of these things. I'm going to therapy and I get in an argument and they still think it's my fault. That's not fair. Why doesn't anyone see how good I'm doing? Why does everyone have to blame me all the time? Why is it always my fault? It can't be. Mm, right? I'm Rose Skeeters, host of From Borderline to Beautiful, a show about hope and recovery for BPD. Welcome back for another episode of From Borderline to Beautiful. Thank you to everyone who reached out to me to ask how the move is going. Things are good now. Power has been restored and we are loving our new life. We moved from the hustle and bustle of the city to a very rural area. When I look outside my window, I get to see two beautiful willow trees and cornfields. It is so peaceful, worth every bit of struggle to get here, actually. I appreciate all of the love and support I have received this past week, though, so thank you to everyone. Also, we've reached 25,000 downloads. It's mind-blowing and inspiring. Thank you all for listening. So this week, I want to address one of the most common questions I am asked by clients and listeners. Why is everything always my fault? That's a huge hyperbole too, right? <laughs> okay. Having BPD is rough. What a tough path to walk. Sure, recovery is possible, though I will not negate the sheer difficulty of the journey. It's hard. And even harder still, when you begin your journey and you realize, whoa, my partner, family member, friend, teen or adult kid thinks I'm wrong all the time, blames everything on me and doesn't see that I'm trying to top it all off. There is no way that all of this is my fault, is there? So the short answer is yes. <laughs> it is most likely your fault, unfortunately. There are certain situations, of course, where we do get into relationships with someone who is abusive because maybe that is what we know or we're used to, or maybe we even feel like we deserve that. But overall, a lot of the times, arguments and things like that are our fault. I don't mean this in some degrading way, like it's all your fault that someone abused you. I'm not saying that at all. I am saying that we need to take responsibility for ourselves and our behaviors, as well as our altered and often negative perception of reality. Remember that borderline personality disorder comes with it, a perception of reality that is filled with narratives of dragons, of assumptions, of persecution, of paranoia, of rejection. That is not the perception of a neurotypical person. We overanalyze th analyze things and we read between the lines, so to speak, in order to catch the person that we are with in a lie or to fulfill the prophecy that everyone leaves us. Neurotypical folks don't do that, guys. We are also not used to unconditional love, so we take our love completely away from others when we experience intense emotion. There isn't even enough space to love others when we get that way, so we aren't doing it intentionally, but taking love away from someone is horribly painful for them, and it makes them feel hated. So yes, we have to take everything initially on as our fault so that we can walk the clear path to recovery. Remember, 
You cannot evaluate the mental stability of someone else if you yourself are not loyal to your word and, in, and strong in character. Once you have had several months, that's right, months of stability under your belt, then you can look around and start assessing whether or not the people you choose to be in your life are willing to support the person you are becoming and change the way they respond and interact with you or whether or not they need the boot. <laughs> Rather than asking yourself whether or not your partner is the wrong one because everything can't always be your fault, I challenge you to ask yourself how you can choose to see their perception instead of only living in your own narrow worldview. Can you open your mind to it? I remember this feeling all too well, honestly. When I discovered Okay, now is the time to change. Rose, you need to get yourself together so you can provide a stable home for your son. Remember, I was a single mom before I got married, and I knew I wanted my son to have a father figure in the home, and I knew I didn't want to be alone forever. I craved connection. So when I discovered that I needed to recover, I started making what I thought were huge changes. There goes that hyperbole again, right? Huge changes were huge for me, but they were normal behavior to everyone else. All right, what do I mean by that? Well, I was really selfish and I talked to talk. I only talked to Jay about stuff that I cared about and I only half listened to the things he cared about in the beginning. So when I was going through this recovery process, I tried so hard to listen, to respond thoughtfully, to bring in-depth interactions and conversations to the table in our relationship because I knew that that's what he needed. So picture this. <laughs> in Jay's neurotypical worldview, I was just listening to him. I was just being a good person and a good partner by being thoughtful, kind, and empathetic. All right, what about my worldview? Okay, so in my mind, it was a huge feat to sit there moment to moment and listen, not make the conversation about me, not jump ahead, expect him to read my mind, assume negative things, or jump to conclusions. So while he's sitting there enjoying my presence, thinking all is well in the world, I'm becoming increasingly more and more exhausted because I have had at this point very little practice doing the right thing, and being a good listener and a good person in a relationship. So picture this. I'm sitting there working hard at something that a normal person finds easy, and I'd even go so far as to say natural, while all the while, he's just chilling. After, let's say, two or three days of this, I want a pat on the back. Where's my participation trophy, right? I am crushing this whole talking and intimacy thing. So I want him to tell me how good I'm doing. And I want to know now. I want to know I'm gonna doing a good job. I want him to notice that. So it's like, look at me, look at me, look at me. Look at how good I'm doing. Notice me. I know that those of you listening who struggle with recovery and wanting their partner to see the good that they're doing can feel this. You want validation. I totally get it. Here's the thing. You are most likely not going to get the validation that you are seeking. In my story, it had only been a few days of me doing the work as opposed to a long time of me making the conversation about myself. So first of all, our partners are going to be wary of our change because we talk a good game, but don't back it up and not for any consistent length of time. And second of all, well, this is really hard to hear, so please understand that I come from a place of love and hope for you all, but we don't get rewarded for engaging in normal behavior. Jay said that to me, and boy did it make me angry. I was pissed. I remember thinking, what? We don't get rewarded, but I'm not normal, and I'm trying to be normal, and you won't reward me even then? You won't validate me? Are you kidding me right now? And then, of course, in my mind, I'd go to, he's a bad guy, he's the problem, he's being so mean to me, he's abusive, he's gaslighting me, you know, our big BPD go-tos when we're having a tantrum. Because that's what it is. It's another covert acting out behavior. Look at me, look at me, look at me. 
So that's the selfish nature of the disorder. And also, pat me on the back, pat me on the back, pat me on the back, right? So then what would happen usually, what a lot of people tell me, is that they bring it up in conversation. Like they just start talking about like how good they're doing in terms of their recovery. And then, you know, you expect validation because you need support to know if you're on the right path. And then your partner or loved one, they don't notice or express concern. Um, they don't say anything to pat you on the back. And maybe they even say, well, I'm wary of this. I'm concerned because this seems temporary. And what happens after that? They're like, well, this is kind of temporary. Then you start saying, okay, well, no matter what I do, it's always my fault, right? How many of you have been there? Okay, lots of listeners, I'm sure, and lots of family members and love, loved ones on the receiving end of this. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is this. The reward for normal behavior is in the connection you will ultimately feel to your partner, friend, family member when you begin to care as much or more about them than you do yourself. That is the reward. Not a superficial, temporary pat on the back. Also, if only a few days or a month has passed with the work that you are doing, there is a huge possibility that your partner or loved one is skeptical because let's face it, how many other times have we just been good for a while and then went right back to the way things were? A lot of times I'd venture to say, that is one of the reasons people with BPD get misdiagnosed as bipolar one or two. Because there are periods of time where we're all good and engaging in normal behavior. <laughs> Until then, that is, we get uncomfortable or life becomes too much to take or handle. So give it time. Allow the person that you are in relationship with time to see your growth. Validate yourself. Stay loyal to your word. What do I mean by that? Stay loyal to your word. If you say you are going to do everything in your power to recover, do that. If you say you are doing it for you and not for anyone else, then actually do it for you without expecting the pat on the back from anyone else. I promise you that if you chose good people, then those people will see your hard work once you have done this consistently. And if they don't after several months, then you will be strong enough in your character to either seek help to evaluate the relationship and gain a fresh perspective or to evaluate the relationship yourself to see if you guys need therapy or coaching support, or to see if you need to end the relationship. I really want you to ponder this next question. Many people ask me how to get their family to see them, to understand them. I had someone say that they begged their family just to see their point of view just to meet them where they are, because after all, they have to see the point of view of their family members, so why can't their family members take the time to see the point of view that they have in their BPD mind? Someone even tried to convince me that if their family could only see their BPD perception, that she would stop arguing with them, and that would repair the entire relationship. This doesn't make sense, so let's think about it. If there are 50 people in a room and all of those 50 people think the sky is blue, and you think the sky is red, who's right? You? Should the 50 people who think that the sky is blue change their mind when you start yelling at them? What about when you say they are gaslighting you and not validating your truth because you see a red sky? Sounds ridiculous, right? I hope it does. Think about how often you do this with information that is more close to the heart. If all 15 family members think you act out and you're the only one who thinks they're wrong, at what point do you stop digging in your heels and accept that your version of reality isn't the same as everyone else's reality? Look, I get it, guys. We live in a society that says that the person that sees the red shot sky should be coddled and protected and that the person that sees the red sky should live out their truth regardless of the actual truth. But that is another mentality that's 
like playing with fire. We cannot continuously expect the world to bend for us to meet our needs. We are the ones with the disability, with the disorder. We need to do the work necessary to see and respect a neurotypical point of view in order to gain access to all the things we want, right? We want normalcy, connection, contentment, peace, a sense of belonging. We want people to not leave us. All of those things will come to you if you are able to see reality as it is and not what you created it to be in your BPD mind. The truth, the actual truth, is very different from your truth. So how do you find the truth? Great question. The truth is based on facts, not opinions and emotions, not assumptions and jumping to conclusions. Think of yourself as a judge in a court of law. Well, a fair court of law, that is. Jay used to tell me how to do the dishes. And boy, it drove me nuts. I would think he doesn't think I'm good enough at cleaning or something else extreme and I would get offended. The facts were that he was being nice when he talked to me. He was trying to be helpful and I wasted too much soap. So he's actually attempting to teach me something in a way that he thought would benefit our family and our budget. Those were the facts. He wasn't attacking me. So I was able to see the facts and alter my response to his teaching rather than just reacting to whatever dragon I was creating in my mind. And by dragon, I mean assumption. So when you are feeling like everything is your fault and the world is against you, remember first that part of the journey of recovery is to align your perception with per the perception of the rest of the world, the non-BPD folks, the people that believe that the sky is blue, and then remember to find the facts. Be loyal to your word, be patient with yourself and those around you and the process, and maintain discipline to the mission the mission of recovery. Are you feeling lost, frustrated, or resentment towards your loved ones, your friends, your family, your partner, your kids? Are you looking for online counseling or mindset and life coaching because of this pandemic? Go ahead and check out thriveonlinecounseling.com. Again, that's thriveonlinecounseling.com. We offer secure, convenient, and confidential telehealth sessions. You can schedule your free initial consult right online or even pay for your first 60-minute individual session. Give us a call at 1-844-984-7483 if you have any questions at all. Let us be a part of your recovery journey. Okay, now it's time for Q&A. This question comes from someone from our Facebook group. Is there ever appropriate times when it is important to be honest or vulnerable about your BPD diagnosis? For example, in the workplace, with family and friends, etc. Okay, this is an awesome question. So when should you tell people, if at all or if ever, that you have BPD? Well, it really depends on what your goal is. This is a really difficult question to answer, honestly, because if you replace the question with depression, this is how it would read. Is there ever appropriate times when it is important to be honest or vulnerable about your depression diagnosis, about your anxiety diagnosis? So if you were asking me if there was an appropriate time for you to tell your employer, let's say, that you had depression or anxiety. I would say, yeah, absolutely. If you were someone who had panic attacks or panic episodes and you have to, that would interfere with your ability to do your job, then you should probably not tell your, you know, direct boss, but go to human resources and, you know, try to get FMLA, which in the States, that's you know, um, Family Medical Leave Act, where if you have a disability or a diagnosis that would prevent you from working and you could prove that you had that, then you would get accommodations. So you could do that. But I, I wouldn't recommend 
unfortunately, here's the stigma, right? Like to go to your employer and say that you have borderline personality disorder is a, is, it's, it's, you know, a fuzzy line. Why? Because borderline personality disorder and personality disorders in general are often lumped in the same category. So for people who don't know anything about BPD or enough, they are going to lump BPD in the same category as narcissism. Um, yeah, as narcissistic personality disorder, as histrionic personality disorder, and just like, you know, equate personality disorder with crazy or insane or, you know, whatever, like, negative term you could use. So personally, I will tell you what I do because I can't, you know, everyone out there listening, even the person who answered this question or asked this question has their own unique individual story. So when it comes to the workplace with borderline personality di disorder diagnosis, I would not disclose that. I would not disclose that diagnosis because that diagnosis could be perceived by your employer as a diagnosis that create that would put you in a position that make, that makes you look unstable even if you had a valid reason to be upset and that goes for even primary care physicians that's me not as a clinician me as a person in the world who also had the diagnosis in the past i would not disclose that diagnosis to people especially hospitals and doctors. I actually had Lyme disease. Um, and long story short, it was in my history that my mother had borderline personality disorder and that I had BPD f um, flares, flavors of BPD, quote unquote. And they didn't treat the Lyme disease as seriously. So, you know, it's something where you just don't want to be in that in that position. So let's look at family and friends. I mean, it depends on what your motive is. If your family wants to know what's up with you and you get an answer and you want to be like, this is what I have and I'm going to recover from it. And you can sit that person down because they're close to you and say to them, hey, you know what? I have this diagnosis. I don't want you to read what you would read online about borderline personality disorder because the stigma is really bad. And so I'm going to tell you about it. Send them the podcast to, you know, educate them. If your purpose is to educate them because they know you've been struggling and they are willing, ready, willing, and able to support you. Same thing with friends. You know, I, with friends, again, depends on how close the friend is. You really have to remember that borderline personality disorder and the stigma, you know, attached to it is, is it's intense. People don't look kindly upon people with personality disorders. And I know that that's hurtful, um, but it's the truth. You know, I'm sure that m many of the people that listen, especially that, you know, what I say resonates with them, they have stories that they could tell you. You, you guys probably have lots of stories. I hear them a lot where you have had even a therapist to tell you. Like this is a good one is that therapists will tell people, no, 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 you don't have BPD. No, you, you can't. Those people are crazy, right? And then you're like, but no, I, you know, I probably do. So you want to just be careful of that, of that stigma. You know, definitely you don't want people to judge you based upon a diagnosis. Now let's look at um, romantic relationships. If you're in a new romantic relationship with someone and you have borderline personality disorder and you feel the need to tell this person it's a bad idea i'm gonna tell you it's i don't think it's a good idea let's say that you have had some sort of trauma in your life like let's say something really horrible happened to you think about it would you tell the person that you're dating that really vulnerable traumatic experience that happened to you you know, I, I doubt it. I think you'd probably wait a while to tell someone something vulnerable because we have a hard time being vulnerable, right? So if you wouldn't tell the person that, then you don't tell them that you have BPD right from the jump. Allow the relationship to grow and flourish. And if you have a tantrum, say, ah, I can be a little quirky and impulsive and have that conversation when the time arises. It's not like, you know... I'm not telling you to lie to the people that you're with. I'm just saying that if a person isn't close enough to you to be trusted with your, you know, 
innermost secrets with things that you keep close to your heart then they don't deserve to know an intimate detail of your life like that you have a personality disorder because then they will take the information and use it against you just like any other negative information that they could possibly you know do that with so just be picky, be choosy about who you disclose that you have the diagnosis with. And if you choose to tell someone, educate them. Send them over to that McLean study, send them this podcast, send them, you know, Daniel Fox, pretty sure that's his name, over on YouTube. Send, him, send them to sources of information that will provide hope, logic, and... Um, just truth, not someone random complaining or some information that's for people who are hurt by people with BPD, nothing with stigma associated with it. Awesome. That was a very long-winded response to a question, so we'll wrap it up there for today. Thank you all for listening. Once again, I hope you have a great week, and I will see you next Wednesday. Okay, thanks for listening. That was from Borderline and Beautiful, a production of Thrive Mind Body LLC, online coaching that helps frustrated individuals, resentful couples, and disconnected families navigate through tough times. Visit us on the web at thriveonlinecounseling.com. If you like this show, remember, you can hear it on Anchor or Apple Podcasts or Pocket Casts or any app that you use to listen to podcasts. Subscribe to get a new episode every Monday. If you want to get in touch, you can leave me a voice message. Some of you had some comments and questions from the last episodes, and I'd love to hear whatever questions you have too. Just download the Anchor mobile app, search for From Borderline to Beautiful, and tap the message button to send me a voice message. We'll have all those links in the show description. Okay, we made it. Thanks again for listening. I'm Rose Skeeters, and I'll be back next week with another episode of From Borderline to Beautiful. Talk to you then.